While practicing exchanging self and others, there are two main obstacles. Some people believe that the happiness and suffering of oneself and others stem from different entities. They think, I experience my suffering with my body and mind, and others experience their suffering with their body and mind. They are distinct, like the colours blue and yellow. Due to the attachment to the difference between oneself and others, we seek to adjust or relieve the suffering that arises in ourselves, but ignore the suffering of others, thinking it is none of our business. This is the most common mentality among sentient beings. How did Lama Tsongkhapa guide us in overcoming this mentality? Here is the explanation. The method to overcome this misconception is to recognize that there is no inherent difference between oneself and others. The difference is relative. For example, from my perspective, I am the self while the other person is the other. However, from the other person's perspective, what they refer to as self refers to themselves. It is similar to how we perceive this mountain and that mountain. We merely label them based on different perspectives. However, there is no absolute self or absolute other. For example, when we stand here, we perceive the mountain on the other shore as that mountain. But when we arrive at the foot of that mountain, what was once on the other shore becomes right in front of us. That mountain becomes this mountain. Therefore, this and that are relative, not absolute. Similarly, this also applies to the relocation of the mind. For example, Li Ti Guai, a hermit who practiced meditative concentration, planned to have a trip for his mind. Before the trip, he instructed his disciple, My mind will travel for a while and then return to my physical body. During this period, please help me guard my body. Perhaps because his mind had been travelling for too long, his disciple thought he had died and thus cremated his body. Later, he had no choice but to move into the body of a recently deceased cripple. He turned from a handsome man into an unsightly cripple. He considered the previous handsome body as him, while others regarded the unsightly cripple as him. But was that him? It might not necessarily be him. They perceived different bodies as him. In fact, each of us perceives our appearance and body as ourselves. Moreover, we cling to our sensations, believing that the body experiences pain or pleasure. But where is pleasure? We tend to think that it is the body that experiences pleasure, but this is not true. If the body were dead, could it still feel pleasure? No, it couldn't. The body is a medium for experiencing pain or pleasure, but cannot generate pain or pleasure. This is similar to the fact that sound is not born from air. However, without air, you couldn't hear the sound. Air serves as a medium for transmitting energy. When the energy reaches the eardrum and causes it to vibrate, sound arises. However, the sound is not air. The vibration of air is different from sound. Our auditory consciousness has a certain relationship with the vibration of air. Without the vibration of air transmitting sound waves, we would not perceive the sound. However, sound and sound waves are not the same thing. Similarly, we perceive sensations such as pain, itchiness or comfort in our bodies. However, in reality, these sensations are not physical. The aggregate of sensations is a mental phenomenon. The body merely serves as a medium for the arising of sensations. 
we tend to be attached to the body, perceiving pain or itchiness here and there. However, in reality, the body does not experience pain or itchiness. The body and mind are connected. One's appearance arises from one's mind. Similarly, the state of your mind determines the state of your body. The body and mind are intertwined. Hence, ordinary beings sometimes cannot differentiate between them. This is the biggest obstacle. We perceive I and others as different entities. We don't know that these two labels are interchangeable. There is no absolute I or absolute others. The training anthology states, practicing equalizing self and others can strengthen bodhicitta. Self and others are relative notions as illusory as this and that. If self differs from others, who is the absolute self? Since no one possesses the inherent nature of self, who can be labelled other? The training anthology states that practising equalising self and others can strengthen bodhicitta. This is because self and others are just relative labels, as illusory as the so-called this and that. If self and others are different, who absolutely possesses the inherent nature of self? This is about the wisdom of non-self. Only when you are selfless will you realize that self and others are just labels. You establish an I on these five aggregates and call it self. Yet you can also call it other because self and other are just conventional labels. What is the inherent nature of this? Since no one possesses the inherent nature of self, who is the absolute other? In fact, that alone cannot be called that. That is a label relative to this. This and that are relative notions. But what is this? This is also relative to that. Without that, nothing could be labelled as this. All phenomena are devoid of inherent nature. They are just illusions that arise from causes and conditions. We configure various wrong settings based on these illusions, leading to delusions. What spiritual practice does is to delete these wrong settings thereby dissolving many coarse afflictions. Coarse afflictions will naturally dissolve. Subtle afflictions need to be eliminated by practicing tranquility and insight. Coarse afflictions, however, can be removed by changing our understanding. To overcome subtle afflictions, we should practice concentration and analytical meditation. Humans can concentrate to some extent. However, our concentration is limited, so the afflictions we can change are also limited. Once we change our views, deeper concentration can enable us to eliminate afflictions more thoroughly. To change views, we need wisdom. To attain wisdom, we need the support of concentration. Only then can we transform afflictions. After attaining wisdom, we still need concentration to eliminate afflictions. Deeper concentration allows us to eliminate more, deeper and subtler afflictions. That is why the effect is related to the level of concentration. To remove subtle afflictions, we need to practice tranquility and insight. With the insight of non-self, deeper concentration can enable us to eliminate self-attachment more swiftly. Without concentration, 
Your wisdom is mere intellectual understanding, and it will be hard to eradicate self-attachment. You may intellectually understand self-attachment, but you cannot truly uproot it because you don't have concentration. Currently, we are in the stage of learning and contemplating the wisdom of non-self. To truly see non-self, we need to enter deeper concentration. At that point, we can eliminate the ingrained and subtle self-attachment we usually cannot notice. Therefore, self and others are relative. Through practice, we can change our understanding of self and others. Everything is established in a relative sense and has no inherent nature. This is a summary of the above verses quoted from the training anthology. It means that all things are established based on relations between each other, without inherent and unchanging nature. Inherent nature means an independent and unchanging nature. The explanation provided here is quite clear. I have also explained it in a similar way. Inherent nature is an intrinsic and unchanging characteristic formed by oneself. It does not rely on external factors. It is singular, independent and unchanging. According to the Buddha's teachings, Everything in the world arises from causes and conditions, without inherent and unchanging nature. Just as Nagarjuna stated in The Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way, all phenomena do not arise from themselves, nor do they arise from others, nor from both themselves and others, or without a cause. Thus, we know that they have never arisen. All phenomena have never truly arisen. They only appear and disappear in an illusory manner. Let's use the example of a shadow on a wall to illustrate it. Does the shadow on the wall truly arise and cease? It is merely an illusory appearance of arising and ceasing, not a real birth and death. This is what is meant by non-arising. The non-arising taught by Nagarjuna doesn't mean that nothing has arisen. Instead, it means that phenomena appear in an illusory manner. They are illusory.